services company and actually i'm quite surprised that my lightning talk got uh, accepted because i just saw it yesterday and i just supo- uh, submitted a proposal uh, but um, the, what i wanted to talk today is about little bit about uh, culture values um, and the uh, way people look at uh, agile as you move from like one country to another um i work for the i've been working for shlambaje for about 8 um, years now and um you know it's a relatively short time for people to like move between countries and uh, i've had like um, a nice opportunity actually to be in like three uh, countries slash continents uh, so sort of i thought it might be good to um, talk a little bit about culture and peop- way people look at uh, things in one place as um a post to another so um i started off at uh, shlambaje in um, houston in the us um and um uh, the thing is that um over there uh, i started off like uh, i went to grad school in the us so after i finished off college i uh, joined shlambaje and i found that you know a bunch of us uh, joined the company together and always i find that you know newcomers uh or freshers as they say in the companies they generally little i mean in in the us i found that people are really cocky and kind of also confident about what they want to do and you know what they can bring on to the table into the company and stuff like that whereas um the next country i moved to like in germany people are little more guarded you know so we had a lot more youngsters coming in uh and there they guarded they don't really uh, like an engineering grad will not really uh, right off the bat will not tell you what his or her skills are um and they more guarded and in india um i find that uh, can you hear me yeah and in india i find that people are in fact uh, a little bit more guarded you know so you really need to go and like tease out things from them and say you know you have to earn their trust before they actually come and you know start selling themselves after you've um uh, you know been in the company and um the other thing um about sharing you know that's another thing which i saw about amongst the companies i mean among amongst the different countries uh the us i found people are generally very very um uh, into like sharing and maybe it's just the way the you know the culture that there is they're really into like you know having a lot of lunch and learns and you know getting across to different teams talking and communicating and stuff like that in germany i found that uh people don't really talk as much and only i mean there's no small talk so like like i remember in the us where you know your coffee room conversations were so good to like you know uh, talk about a new idea or you know just talk it out with somebody from another team it was so accessible to do stuff like that but in germany i found that it was uh, people just generally don't actually number one there's no small talk you know so that took some time so there's usually people don't do small talk so you have to go across and talk to people and of course once you start talking this there's a lot of nice ideas that you can learn in india i find it's somewhere in between there are some people who are uh, sort of open to sharing some people not so much and there's uh, i guess in some other talk i saw there's also this whole um, hierarchy and organization and how many years you've been in the uh, company and you know there's that little bit of uh, people are scared to come and talk whereas in the us which i found was like a fresher would you know i mean zero years in the company he'll go and talk to like i was one of them i went and spoke to the uh, software architect like on my first day at the job and said i think your software architecture document has got some serious flaws and obviously i mean i mean but i was able to do that whereas in india i can imagine i mean i don't really imagine anybody would come and do that and in germany it's again it's kind of mixed maybe there are some guys who are really smart they would probably come and say it but again everybody's a little guarded and um, lastly yeah another thing is about this the sharing thing you know so um a lot of places in all these three countries i found that we used to have this concept which i guess is there in other companies as well is you have this concept of doing a lunch and learn or some kind of group discussion on a new topic and in in the us it was like it's really cool everybody would want to jump on to it you also get a free lunch from the company so a lot of people are queuing up in india also i guess the free lunch and also apart from the fact that you want to learn but in germany what i found very very funny was that when i i uh, when i we actually in germany the company that um, was actually bought over by schlumberge so you know a couple of us were transferred over from the us so that we would uh, you know uh, smoothen the transition and stuff so when we did this lunch and learn there actually a couple of them uh, were kind of uh, i think we organized this and there were just about like five or six people who turned up and i found that really strange 
and th and then somebody from one of my friends, um, one of my lunch friends, told me that actually some people were offended by the fact that we were doing a lunch and learn. And I was shocked because I was like, "What? Um, I thought it was a cool thing. You get to learn a new topic, and it's really nice, and you know, can interact with people on something other than what you work on daily." And then I was told that people there think that if you, uh, if the company is making you work during your lunch time, that's actually going into their personal space. So, so that kind of thing. So this is like these few experiences that I wanted to share, and all of this actually makes quite a bit of difference when you're trying to uh, go agile. I think so kind of makes uh, your success uh, really differs uh, based on the continent and yeah the geographical location so yeah thanks hello everyone uh, my name is amit deshpande uh, i am from software ag i'm a senior manager out there and what i wanted to talk uh, today is basically our experiences with agile the Scrum and uh, Kanban methodologies and where we are at this point. So we adopted the Agile Scrum methodologies about four years back. Um, so we were told to follow Scrum pretty much and see how it goes. <laughs> so it, it's been experimental uh, all through, I would say. And I wanted to just give a brief experience of wh where, where we started and where we are. So when we started with Scrum, we were told that, well, there's going to be a process we have to follow. We've got to divide your work into sprints, obviously. And there's going to be a planning session. Go ahead and make sure that you're doing your stand-ups, see where we are each day, and then do a demo towards the end of uh, each sprint and make sure that uh, it's getting accepted by the product owners and uh, then finally follow up with the retrospective and uh, see what we can improve on continuously. So that, that was great. I mean, uh, dividing our work and making sure that we are delivering something towards the uh, end of every sprint. Um, but then there is a commitment aspect which is involved in each sprint. You've got to deliver something. You've got to plan, and you've got to make sure that it's getting done. And if it is not done, then the sprint is kind of considered a failure. At least that's how the concept was four years back. And failing in a sprint was not considered a great thing. Um, so most teams would start, and then f they would find that they are failing sprint after sprint. And then we said, well, let's do a root cause and see what's going on. And so some of them said, well, uh, it's going f uh, the features that we've been given that we're able to pick up. Uh, but then there are these requests coming out of nowhere, and these are from management or from the customers, and they are saying, well, you've got to pick this up. And that is not allowing us to finish our sprints. That's demoralizing basically is saying that failing, fail is a bad word, right? I mean, <laughs> um, so we said, well, let's look at alternatives, and then said, let's go to Kanban. How does it sound? Well, this uh, Kanban, where you have a prioritized list, you can pick items from the queue, and you limit your work in progress and get it done. Well, if there is distractions coming in, that's okay. You pick up that becomes a high priority uh, action item and you basically get that done. So we tried to adopt that as well, uh, but then we found it to be loosely coupled, very loosely coupled uh, with what we have to do. And then we said, well, why don't we do something else? We said, well, the commitment was a problem and Kanban doesn't have that, so we'll do something called a scram scrum ban. Uh, I think some of you would be aware of this term. So we are now going ahead with uh, Scrum Ban, and it's been going pretty fine. Basically, we are having planning sessions, uh, see where we are, uh, what we've got accomplished, and what's there in our uh, prioritized list, and uh, keep moving on. And there is no restriction, basically, on what item gets picked in each sprint. Uh, and at the same time, if there is a distraction for example, a customer commitment, then you basically pick that item. Um, so that's uh, that's the experience I wanted to share. So we are at Scrum Ban at this point, and uh, I know that there are a few talks going on, and I would be interested in hearing 
uh, if possible, what others are facing around the methodologies. All right, thank you. For this slot, I would like to say that if you are interested in speaking and doing some lightning talks, there is a form on the Agile India website, 2014.agileindia.org. You submit and then we'll slot again for tomorrow. We'll pick more speakers and stuff like that. The idea here is to get a grassroots level, like how you are feeling about implementing Agile, what are your exp experiences been, and things like that, so that more people learn from different diverse set of practitioners. All right, this is the last talk for this particular slot. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tarang Bakshi. Uh, I work for ThoughtWorks as a project manager and a business analyst. Uh, so my topic, if the screen comes up, is, is actually much narrower than uh, the previous two uh, speakers. Uh, I'm going to be talking about no estimates uh, in the real world. I guess this sort of thing has to happen, right? There's always technical difficulties at every technical conference. So uh, early in 2013, uh, the uh, you know the the software geek corner of Twitter was abuzz with this this idea of no estimates. There were a, a lot of heated debates. Sort of people arguing that you shouldn't estimate; it's harmful. Uh, others arguing that uh, people saying that were uh, were out of their minds. Uh, so I so I thought well, it's an interesting topic because in the in the agile world we've got. Uh, uh, you know, of course, we, we we do like to talk about estimation a lot, and you know, so so there's more blabber on estimation here. But but the reason this topic got me interested was that uh, uh, you know we I I hate estimation. Uh, I think it's a waste of time, particularly the upfront estimation that happens to forecast uh, you know timelines for a project and the cost for a project. So 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 if there is something out there, if there are ideas out there, can get then get us from this notion more estimates to no estimates. Hey, you know what? I'm I'm all ears. I want to hear uh, what it's all about. Um, so, so you know, just you know, so for those unfamiliar with with this um, idea of no estimates, there was a. Uh, I'll talk about the central premise. The central premise here is that. Okay, the central premise is that uh, for, for any decisions related to software, you should not use estimates. Uh, instead, you start building the application or the thing that you're trying to develop and start incrementally building towards it and getting towards uh, the end outcome. Uh, so that's the, the core of the argument. But, uh, you know, I mean, it doesn't, I don't know how much for us, at least for, the, for those of us in the room, uh, you know, is that really practical uh, in the real world? There were even suggestions from some of the proponents saying that if you're working for a client and the client says, give me estimates, think about whether you really want to work for them. So I work for a consulting company, right? I mean, we, we can't survive if we tell customers, hey, just let us come in. We can't tell you how much it's going to cost, how much time it will take. Let us start building stuff. So there needed to be something in the real world that, that can actually work. So you know, so this got me thinking, so, OK, so, so let's step back, right? Why, do, why are we actually doing estimates? It's either to you know, answer a question like, OK, how much is it going to cost? How much time is it going to take? Uh, so if that's what we're trying to do, but that's not the real question, right? Nobody really cares just for the sake of it how much it's going to cost and how much it's going to take. There are some decisions, underlying decisions, that those things are informing. So decisions like, oh, uh, how much budget do I need to go ask my management for? Should I build this or should I buy an off-the-shelf product? Should I look to replace an existing product or should I fix it? Right? There are some real uh, uh, I know hard, hard decisions that have to be made. So you're trying to inform uh, these decisions by the act of trying to do some estimates. 
But here is where, where we run into trouble, right? Because uh, the notion of estimation uh, as it stands today, even on a lot of agile projects, stems from uh, the 1990s world that Martin was talking about earlier today of plan-driven estimates. So it's looked as a tool for, for, you know, uh, for predicting uh, a lot of things well up in advance, saying, oh, let's predict the next 12 months. What does it look like? Let's put some you know, estimates on uh, 300 stories and add them all up, and that will tell us what uh, what next 12 months will look like. Or it, the problem is that it's, um, you know, it's also taken as, uh, an es if I get an estimate from my vendor or from my IT team, it means that I have a commitment. So it's replacing the trust that you would have to with the, from the delivery team with some number saying, oh, you guys said this will take three months. What do you mean it's going to take four and a half now, right? Uh, another common problem uh, you know, with, with this approach that we're, we're taking of estimation is that uh, you know, there's often a misconception that the more time you spend doing estimates in more detail, the more accurate your estimates will be. So I call that the slope of good hope, right? It, it actually <laughs> doesn't, doesn't <laughs> uh, slope in that direction at all. Uh, so these are some of the, the challenges with this approach. So, uh, so, so what should we do, right? If we if we do have to provide an estimate for whatever, for for responding to an RFP or to convince uh, you know someone that budget is needed, uh, what are some alternatives out there? So these are just some ideas. I won't be able to get into any level of detail into some of these, but just some things I've I've tried or I've seen colleagues try. Um, so, so one uh, one thing you could do, and I wish I could actually see the next slide because. Yeah, so, so one thing uh, we've, we've tried to do, and actually I, I'm going to fo focus on uh, alternatives to just the forecasting part of estimation. There's an aspect around tracking, you know, the st estimation that you do at a sprint level. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to talk about for forecasting, uh, what are some possible uh, alternatives out there to the more traditional ways. Um, so the first one is really, uh, you know, actually d even deciding should you do an estimate. If it looks like your conversation has started to go down a path where, oh, I need this in this much time, I need all of this scope, there is no room for negotiation, and I have only this much money, then actually trying to go ahead and estimate is, is going to solve the wrong problem. You're going to get the conversation in a direction uh, that it doesn't need to go. So that's the first step. So maybe you need to stop and say, sorry, let's not talk about estimation, there's something else to talk about. Uh, as, an, as an alternative, the second thing you could do is what's the real constraint? Typically, people are asking for time and money, but what's the real constraint? So if you're building an app for the US Open, well, the real constraint is it needs to be live before the actual US Open happens, right? It's not so much about how many dollars are available or, or how, much, uh, uh, you know, how much time a feature is going to take. It's that it's the timeline in which something needs to go there. So maybe you need to talk about the estimate for the real constraint rather than the traditional way of you know, how many story points and how many, uh, uh, how many hours something will take. A related idea is to actually say, instead of telling you how long some a set of features will take, maybe for your timeline constraint, we can talk about scope confidence ranges. So if we know the priority order in which you're going to do this, maybe we can say, hey, you know what? For the top five items, we think it's very likely it will make it. The next five, maybe it will make it, but we're not sure. We'll find out as we go along. And these are not likely to make it for the constraints that you have. Um, you know, the, the yet, yet another thing I've seen is we've gone to clients and we've said, hey, you know what, from what we understand at the start of the project, there are far too many unknowns. We can't give you an estimate, but we can tell you how long it will take to uncover some of these unknowns. So we can tell you whether it'll take us five days, 10 days, three weeks, five weeks. So maybe you provide that and you start with that and, and try to do that instead of trying to just crystal ball a number that doesn't make sense. Uh, and yet another option is uh, maybe forecast for smaller pieces. So, so instead of the entire set of the project, you maybe do a now, next, later, and say, okay, for now, which are a small set of things that maybe can be delivered in two or three months, we can give you some more specific estimates. Next is in a range of weeks, and later is maybe in months or not even estimated at all. Uh, but you know, uh, all of these are, of course, a few different options. But you know, I don't think any of them is really a silver bullet. So I think that conundrum is going to continue, right? When there's there's big upfront budgeting cycles, when when release cycles are still uh, you know 12 to 16 or 18 months long, uh, this conundrum is going to continue. And I think uh, you know, as uh, if any of you have any ideas that you've heard of, just uh, reach out to me after uh, after this, and I'd love to hear what your experiences are. Yeah, so that's it. Uh, if you have more ideas, uh, put more proposals for lightning talks for tomorrow and day after tomorrow and the day after that. Thank you.